Good morning. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to the July 2020 board meeting. I call this open meeting of the NCRA board to order. As in our previous board meetings over the last several months, I will again note for the record that due to the COVID-19 pandemic, today's meeting is open to the public via live webcast only. I'd like to thank our OCIO team for making this possible. Thank you, as always, to the NCRA staff who have all stepped up to make it possible for us to continue operations during this difficult time by keeping the NCRA open for business during our remote work posture. I'd now like to begin with today's agenda. The first item on our agenda today is Final Rule Part 701, Appendix B, Chartering and Field of Membership. Staff presenting, Ian Marina, Associate General Counsel, Marvin Shaw, Staff Attorney, Office of General Counsel, and Susan Ryan, Director, Division of Consumer Access West and Cure. Good morning. Good morning, this is Ian Morena. We are here to present a final rule to amend the NCOA's Chartering and Field of Membership Manual. This final rule follows the Board's October 2019 proposed rule on this subject. This relates to a prior rule from 2016 on this same subject, so I will give some history on the Board's rulemakings on field of membership to put today's final rule into context. In October 2016, following a November 2015 proposed rule, the Board approved a final field of membership rule, which we refer to as FOM1, to amend various parts of the Field of Membership Manual. I'll focus on a few of the community-based provisions, although it is worth noting that FOM1 made other changes to Field of Membership requirements. For our purposes today, the most relevant changes made in the FOM1 final rule were to, one, permit federal credit unions to serve a combined statistical area, or portion of one, as a presumptive well-defined local community, subject to a 2.5 million population limit for the chosen portion. Two, to eliminate the requirement for a federal credit union serving a core-based statistical area to serve its core area. And three, to permit federal credit unions to serve uh, an adjacent area attached to a, a statistical area, including a combined statistical area or a core-based statistical area. Shortly after the final FOM1 rule was issued in October 2016, the American Bankers Association sued in federal district court in the District of Columbia to challenge certain FOM1 provisions, including those that I just outlined previously. District court issued a decision in March 2018 vacating the combined statistical area provision, as well as a provision that allowed federal credit unions to serve rural districts up to a population of 1 million. However, the court upheld the adjacent area provision that I mentioned, as well as the, the core area provision that I also mentioned. Now, both parties appealed this district court decision. NCOA appealed on combined statistical areas and rural districts, and the ABA appealed on the core area provision. The DC Circuit Court of Appeals panel ruled unanimously in a decision largely in favor of the NCOA in August 2019. Specifically, the court ruled in favor of NCUA on the rural district and combined statistical area provisions, finding them consistent with the definitions in the Federal Credit Union Act. On the core area service provision, the court found the definition was consistent with the Federal Credit Union Act, but ordered the matter to be remanded to the agency for further explanation in light of potential concerns about credit unions being permitted to redline or gerrymander these areas for discriminatory reasons. The court also noted it expected the agency to act expeditiously to provide this further explanation. The board acted promptly to approve a proposed rule on this subject in October 2019. Today's final rule, if approved by the board, would adopt these provisions as proposed. The rule has three components that I will briefly outline. First, the rule would reinstate the combined statistical area provision as adopted in the final FOM1 rule from 2016. Second, the final rule explains further with additional reasoning and factual support the basis for eliminating the core area service requirement for federal credit unions that choose to serve a combined statistical area. 
Specifically, the rule notes how eliminating this requirement may allow for more service to low and moderate income people outside core areas. It may also enable federal credit unions with limited capacity to serve areas appropriate for their resources. Also, the rule provides examples and information on how this feature may be beneficial in practice for areas where the core may have affluent people and outlying areas may have many low and moderate income people. And third, the final rule would amend the NCUA's regulations regarding community FOM applications, amendments, and expansions for combined statistical areas and core-based statistical areas to require applicants to explain why they've selected the chosen field of membership and to demonstrate that the selection will serve low and moderate income segments of a community. Specifically, the final rule will provide express authority for the agency to review and follow up on these submissions and reject an application if the agency determines that the selection reflects discriminatory purpose. It's worth noting that this new provision would build on existing processes under which applicants for these charters explain and support the choice of their community and how they will intend to serve it. Uh, in addition, during this time, the ABA made two further requests for review, which have just recently been exhausted. First, they requested an en banc hearing at the full D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, which was rejected in December 2019. And second, they filed a petition with the Supreme Court seeking further review of the case. The Supreme Court just recently denied this request in late June 2020. With that background, I will now turn the presentation over to Marvin Shaw to discuss the comments on the proposed rule and how the final rule addresses that feedback. Shaw, discuss our review of the comments in the final rule. We received 128 comments, including from national trade associations, state leagues, credit unions, and banks. A number of banks submitted form letters opposing the proposal, particularly on the topic of eliminating the core service provision. Reviewing the comments and formulating the final rule, we responded to concerns raised by the circuit court and the commenters. In addition, we follow closely the guiding principles established by the Act, including, first, force directly to the agency for financial opportunities for people of modest means. And Congress directed the agency to ensure the safety and soundness of credit unions and the credit union system. In addition, ex by expanding opportunities for new community charters, we sought to enhance consumer choice through competition among financial institutions. With respect to CSA, with the circuit court's decision, this decision was an unpersuasive by the APA, which restated the trial court's arguments that were repudiated by the court. With respect to the core service provision, we elaborated on the discussion in the proposal. In particular, we analyzed how Congress has directed financial institutions to provide financial services to people of modest means. Congress has treated banks differently than credit unions, given their respective histories in providing service to underserved communities. Unlike credit unions, banks have a long history dating back to the Great Depression of over-discrimination and redlining to rent financial services to poorer communities. This resulted in Congress signing the Community Reinvestment Act to banks but not credit unions. The bank commenters failed to respond to this fundamental issue of how Congress determined that banks and not credit unions need to be subject to the anti-redlining provisions in CRA. We also relied on the, Congress's, the agency's extensive experience in reviewing community chartering applications with a specific focus on changing demographics. Specifically, many core service areas have affluent areas while nearby suburbs have poor areas. We analyzed Atlanta and Washington, D.C. In the final rule, we directly responded to examples posited by the Cleveland and Detroit. With respect to Cleveland, the agency and real world application supported our proposition. That is, a small credit union with finite resources. You may not be able to have the resources to expand at all. 
in addition to the real world experience and quantitative analysis, we responded to all critical comments, including ABA's reference to GAO reports that relied on stale data from almost 20 years ago. With respect to requirements about ensuring service to people of modest means, the final rule clarifies the chartering manual stating that illegal discrimination will form a basis for rejection of an application. This amendment serves to make explicit requirements to prevent discrimination that have, had been implicit in the chartering manual. That concludes our presentation. Ian, myself, and Susan Ryan will be happy to address any questions the board may have. Thank you. Well, thank you for that presentation. I'm very pleased that the board is considering this final rule. When the courts upheld our field of membership rule, it was welcome news. I believe this decision will also help credit unions grow and reach more potential members in rural and underserved areas. And today's final rule before the board is a significant step forward to fully resolve this particular matter. As I've said before, I intended for the NCUA to take a phased approach to implementing the August 20th, 2019 decision from the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. And with the recent decision by the Supreme Court not to review this decision, the agency is prepared to bring this process to completion. Today, with this rule, the board is taking a critical step in the NCUA's ongoing work to allow credit unions to alleviate some of the difficulties of low-income and underserved Americans in accessing financial services. I often call financial inclusion the civil rights issue of our time, and this rule will help maintain and expand financial access to more Americans in rural and underserved communities. As was mentioned in your presentation, this important work dates back to 2015 and 2016 when the NCUA board issued the rule referred to as FOM1. This rule faced an immediate legal challenge from the American Bankers Association, and I was glad to see the decision from the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals last August upholding key parts of FOM1. As I announced shortly after that decision, I believed it was important for the NCUA to take a phased approach and provide guidance to all credit unions following the court's decision. With the Supreme Court's recent decision declining to hear the ABA's request to review the circuit court's decision, we will now take some critical next steps. Let me highlight some of the key actions we have already accomplished and how today's rule will help us achieve even more progress. As I announced last September, federal credit unions may submit applications seeking expanded rural districts serving geographic regions that encompass up to one million people and that meet the other requirements set forth in the agency's field of membership rules. Subsequent to the Supreme Court's determination not to review our case, the agency has reinstated 18 rural districts that had previously been rolled back. I want to commend the NCRA staff who worked diligently to reinstate these charters. Today, with this new rule, the board is reinstating the combined statistical area option from FOM1 in light of the DC Circuit's favorable decision. With the today's rule, the board is also complying with the D.C. Circuit's expectation to provide further explanation for FOM1's elimination of the core area service requirement for core-based statistical areas. These changes reflect three key principles. First, access to financial services for people of modest means, whether in rural or heavily populated areas. Second, greater choice and flexibility for consumers and federal credit unions. And third, by enhancing flexibility, we will be able to ensure the safety and soundness of a new or expanded community credit union, as well as protect the National Credit Union Share Insurance Fund. I believe this rule will indeed help achieve all of these goals. I also want to emphasize that I take access to financial services very seriously, and therefore I'm delighted that this rule clarifies and enhances the agency's authority to address potential discrimination in the chartering process. Credit unions have a very strong track record in providing services to those of modest means, and these procedures will simply build on the existing process to help ensure continued success in this vital area. Now, everyone, I do have a few questions. 
For the record, can you please update the board on rural district applications that utilize the expanded option from the 2016 final rule since the Supreme Court decision? Hello, yes, this is Susan Ryan. So um, the agency is accepting applications and has reinstated 18 approvals uh, that were rolled back following the district court's decision in 2018. With the Supreme Court declining to hear the ABA's appeal, the agency is fully implementing the expanded rural district option from the 2016 final rule. That concludes my response. Great. Thank you, Susan. And I do have the same question for CSA applications, please. Sure. This is Susan Ryan again. Uh, the agency will be taking steps to accept new combined statistical area applications as they come in once the, once the CSA option is effective again, which will be 30 days after the final rule is published in the Federal Register. The agency will work to reinstate the approvals that were rolled back in 2018, sim similar to the rural district approvals, for those credit unions that remain interested in those amended charter options. That concludes my response. Great. Thank you, Susan, and thank you all, not only for your presentation, but for all the hard work that went into this. I have no further questions. I would now like to recognize Board Member Harper. You're recognized, sir. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and it's always good to hear your voice. And thank you to Ian, Marvin, and Susan, as well as to your colleagues in the Office of General Counsel and the Office of Credit Union Resources and Expansion for all of the excellent work that went into winning the legal challenges to the NCUA's Community Field Membership Rulemaking and into developing the final rule before us today. The U.S. Supreme Court's decision in June on the NCUA's 2016 Field of Membership Rule provided some good news and ended nearly four years of legal wrangling. This decision results in expanding access to affordable financial services for people of modest means and diverse backgrounds. It also results in a stronger federal credit union charter by making our field of membership rules more competitive with the chartering regimes in many states. Now that the Supreme Court has decided not to take up the lawsuit, I am very pleased that the NCUA board is moving quickly to finalize the FOM3 rule. I appreciate all of the staff efforts that went into ensuring that the NCUA board acts expeditiously on this rulemaking, as the DC Circuit Court made clear was its expectation. I will vote in favor of adopting the final rule, which the board proposed last October, and which flows from the ruling by the US Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. As the presentation spells out, uh, today, the final rule would reinstate the previously approved combined statistical areas field of membership standard, provide further explanation for permitting a credit union located in a core-based statistical area to opt out of serving the core, and bolster the NCUA's authority to reject applications to serve community-based fields of membership if the agency determines that the proposal is based on a discriminatory and intent or a desire to exclude low or moderate income individuals. Thank you also, Marvin and Ian, for including the handful of minor edits that I suggested to the text of the final rules preamble. Once the final rule is approved and consistent with the parameters of that final rule, it makes sense for the NCUA to move expeditiously on processing previously approved field of membership applications affected by the lawsuit. I appreciate that here, has already begun that process because many credit unions across the country have been in limbo and unable to uh, serve their true field of membership for several years. One poignant example comes to mind. During my get in the field swing through Pennsylvania one year ago this week, I learned about one credit union's plight with numerous field of membership changes over the last 15 years from its CEO. By way of background, in September 2005, the NCUA approved a Merit Choice Federal Credit Union application for an expanded community charter to include Adams, Cumberland, Dauphin, Lebanon, Perry, and York counties. In July 2007, while approved to serve this six-county area, the credit union merged with another credit union. At, time, at that time, a Merit Choice acquired an office in York. In September 2008, however, a U.S. District Court order returned the charter to just Cumberland County, 
and therefore to the credit union's field of membership prior to the 2005 approval. In April 2009, the NCUA then approved the charter application for an expanded community charter to include Cumberland, Dauphin, and Perry counties. With the field of membership rules released in October 2016 and finalized in February 2017, AmeriChoice Federal Credit Union promptly applied to serve once again uh, to serve the entire core base statistical area, which would include Adams, Cumberland, Dauphin, Lebanon, Perry, and York counties. The credit union received its approval from the NCOA for this expansion in December 2017. However, as the credit union began to implement its marketing plan in the area of the York office and to reach out to reestablish prior business relationships, the NCOA notified the credit union in April 2018 that based on the lawsuit, its charter was once again returned to Cumberland, Dauphin, and Perry counties. Needless to say, the credit union has been very anxious to again regain the core base statistical area of Adams, Cumberland, Dauphin, Lebanon, Perry, and York counties, which have been previously approved two times. Since my meeting last July, I have kept in mind this credit union's difficulties in having to maintain a branch to serve the existing members in a county previously within the field of membership, but being unable to add members within the county because of the lawsuit. Thankfully, the credit union's desired field of membership can be reinstated 30 days after publication of this FOM3 final rule in the Federal Register. Here, which originally approved the application, recently verified once again that the core base statistical area's estimated population of 2.3 million is under the 2.5 million population cap. After three plus years of waiting, there should be no delay in reinstating this credit union's field of membership. And Mr. Chairman, as our country continues to grapple with the issues of economic equity and social justice, we must not lose sight of the credit union system's mission to promote thrift especially for people of modest means. With appropriate guardrails, the NCOA should foster an environment that increases access to financial services for the underserved and the un underserved and the unserved. This people helping people philosophy approach is the backbone of the credit union movement. However, as the Court of Appeals opinion noted, the NCUA had not adequately responded to commenters' objection that the elimination of the core requirement might allow federal credit unions to engage in discriminatory redlining. In response to the court's decision, the final rule we are considering today would amend the NCUA's regulations for community field of membership applications, amendments and expansions for combined statistical areas, and core-based statistical areas. For these fields of membership, the rule will require the applicant to, one, explain why it has selected its field of membership, and two, demonstrate that its selection will serve low and moderate income segments of a community. In order for the NCUA to ensure that a credit union is not engaging in redline, we also need to have a robust fair lending compliance program. The truth of the matter is, however, that the NCUA has focused its examination program primarily on safety and soundness reviews for more than three decades to the detriment of fair lending and other consumer financial protection laws. In fact, in 2019, the NCUA completed only 25 fair lending exams, and the agency has a goal of completing just 30 fair lending exams in 2020. Due to the pandemic, however, we may not even reach that less than lofty goal. Additionally, the NCUA's current method of examining for compliance with consumer financial protection laws in a credit union with total assets of $10 billion or less differs from other financial institutions regulators, which complete regularly scheduled, risk-focused consumer compliance reviews and assign a separate consumer compliance rating outside of the CAMEL process for the depository institutions under their jurisdiction. To evolve and address the imbalance in the NCUA's consumer compliance program, I have repeatedly called for the establishment of an, an expanded, dedicated, and robust consumer compliance exam program, especially for the largest credit unions. Such a compliance program would ensure that federal credit unions are actually fulfilling their responsibilities under the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, the Fair Housing Act, and the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act. Lastly, this final rule 
would increase the viability of the Federal Credit Union Charter as compared to the charters in other states especially those states in which the laws and rules governing fields of membership have recently expanded significantly. In this regard, I have a question for staff. Susan, of the 100 federally insured credit unions with the largest potential fields of membership, how many are federal charters and how many are state charters? Uh, this is Susan Ryan. So of the 100 credit unions with the largest potential field of membership, 91 are federally insured state chartered credit unions and nine are federal credit unions. That concludes my response. Susan, that, that, I think that's a really illustrative analysis that of the 100 largest potential fields of membership that just nine are federal charters. I know that the bankers like to attack the NCUA, um, but in, in fact, they need to be focusing their uh, concerns at the states who have expanded more quickly. We are merely taking steps to bring up our program at this time. And given my comments today, I do have one other matter that I would like to explore with you. Namely, Susan, would you discuss how the NCUA will conduct a rigorous analysis to ensure that an applicant for a field of membership change does not engage in redlining. Additionally, how and when will the NCUA conduct regular reviews to protect against redlining after the approval of an application? Okay, so this is Susan Ryan again. We plan to proceed with a robust process for evaluating a credit union's business and marketing plan to determine that they have the ability and intent to provide their products and services to low-income residents of the proposed community. We will also ensure they offer those products and services which meet the needs of the specific demographic characteristics of the proposed community. Uh, after approval of the application, we will monitor those credit unions with a community charter action for three years following their approval to ensure they are in compliance with the business and marketing plan that was approved at the time of their application. Additionally, our Office of Consumer Financial Protection conducts fair lending exams, which will also protect against redlining. So that concludes my response. Susan, thank you for that informative answer. And Ian, Marvin, and Susan, thank you again for your presentation and for your work on this final rule. Mr. Chairman, I will support this final rule and have no further comments at this time. Thank you, Board Member Harper. I'd now like to recognize Board Member McWaters. You are recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I welcome the opportunity to finalize our proposed Build a Membership 3 rule this morning. We have worked on the issues reflected in this proposed rule for many years, including time-consuming and distracting litigation through the federal courts that recently ended when the U.S. Supreme Court denied the cert petition from the American Bankers Association. Our success in the federal courts did not occur by happenstance. Instead, we thoughtfully analyzed the field of membership provisions of the Federal Credit Union Act and the relevant case law and legislative history before proceeding with each FOM rule. I assure you that after over 38 years of legal practice, I would not have assisted with the design, structuring, and implementation of the FOM rules unless I was absolutely confident that they were based upon sound public policy and fell squarely within the four corners of the Federal Credit Union Act and other applicable law. Further, today's rule was prepared in strict compliance with the guidance offered by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia in its opinion. It is also significant to note that the U.S. Supreme Court ended the rural district FOM litigation of the agency. Although there is no need to address this rule in FOM 3, the resolution of the litigation merits special consideration. The rural district rule will assist credit unions in serving underserved and unserved members of rural communities who have limited access, if any access at all, to federally insured financial institutions. Today, credit unions are free to serve an expanded scope of rural individuals and small businesses 
thereby, thereby offering consumers with a viable choice relative to those lenders who operate under a less consumer-friendly business model. Without question, this rule serves as a most significant consumer protection safeguard by helping to transform financial deserts into communities of financial choice, all within the Federal Credit Union Act and without safety and soundness risk. Please allow me to close by quoting Chair Rick Metzger at the October 27, 2016 NCUA board meeting, page 18, when he and I voted to finalize the Rural District FOM rule. Quoting Mr. Metzger, we also know that Congress has a long-standing interest in supporting rural areas whose economies frequently lag urban areas and where a larger proportion of the population consists of persons of modest means. I'll give you an example. In March of last year, I heard from my U.S. Senator from the state of Oregon talking about the small, unincorporated town of Christmas Lake in Rural Valley. It has lost its last financial institution. The several thousand residents of Christmas Valley, you should go there. It's a great place. In the neighboring towns of Fort Rock, Silver Lake, and Summer Lake, now have to drive approximately 150 miles round trip to find a brick and mortar financial institutions. We've all heard of food deserts, areas that lack access to supermarkets and grocery stores. Many rural areas are financial deserts and we can't let communities like Christmas Valley become Christmas Death Valley. We simply have to make it easier for residents of areas to access affordable financial services. This is what this rule helps to accomplish. That ends Mr. Metzger's quote. Let me pick up by saying that's precisely what we have accomplished through hard work and perseverance, all in strict compliance with the Federal Credit Union Act, without safety and soundness risk, and based upon the sound public policy of assisting the underserved and the unserved gain access to federally insured financial institutions. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I have no questions. Great. Thank you, Board Member McWaters. Is there a motion? Uh, this is Board Member Harper. I move that the Board approve Final Rule Part 701, Appendix B, of the NCUA's Rules and Regulations as attached to the Board Action Memorandum. Is there a second to the motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I second the motion. There is a sufficient second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it and let the record show the motion passed three to zero. The second item on our agenda today is proposed rule part 702, transition to current expected credit loss methodology. Staff presenting, Allison Clark, Chief Accountant, Office of Examination and Insurance and Ariel Pereira, Staff Attorney, Office of the General Counsel. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, this is Allison Clark. We are here to present the proposed rule addressing the adoption by credit unions of the current expected loss methodology referred to by its very common acronym, CECL. The proposed rule provides for 60 days of public comment. CECL revises the accounting for credit losses under Generally Accepted Accounting Principles, or GAAP. Most significantly, CECL requires the recognition of lifetime expected credit losses for financial assets measured at amortized cost. Not just those credit losses that have been incurred as of the current reporting date. The Federal Accounting Standards Board, or FASB, established a staggered effective date for CECL. Smaller reporting companies that file with the SEC 
and non-public business entities, including federally insured credit unions, will be required to commence implementation of the new standard for fiscal years beginning after December 15, 2022. However, all other SEC filers, including some institutions supervised by the other banking agencies, were required to begin their compliance in fiscal years beginning after December 15, 2019. Adoption of CECL will result in earlier recognition of credit losses. Upon adoption, an institution will record a cumulative effect adjustment to retained earnings, known as the day one adjustment. This adjustment will be equal to the difference between the amount of credit loss allowances required under the incurred loss methodology being done today and the amount of credit loss allowances required under CECL. Many institutions could experience a sharp increase in expected credit losses as a result of the day one adjustment, which could lower their capital classification. The proposed rule would mitigate these adverse effects to capital ratios resulting from the day one adjustment. For purposes of determining a federally insured credit union's net worth classification, the board would actually phase in that day one effect on the net worth ratio over a three year period. The proposed rule would also provide that federally insured credit unions with less than $10 million in assets are no longer required to determine their charges for loan losses in accordance with GAAP. These credit unions will instead be permitted to use any reasonable reserve methodology provided that it adequately covers known and probable loan losses. I will now turn the presentation over to Ariel who will discuss some of the legal considerations in the development of the proposed rule. And then I will discuss the operation of the proposed phase in. Thank you, Allison. Um, Section 216 of the Federal Credit Union Act authorizes the board to adjust the PCA net, net worth requirements in response to a similar change by the other banking agencies to the leverage limit applicable to the banking organizations under Section 38 of the Federal Deposit Insurance Act. Section 216 establishes certain conditions on these changes to the net worth requirement. First, the change to the net worth ratio must not exceed the difference between the revised leverage limit and 4% of the total assets of supervised banking organizations. Secondly, the board must consult with the OBAs in determining whether the adjustment to the net worth ratio is justified. The proposed phase-in is consistent with the requirements of Section 216. On February 14, 2019, the other banking agencies issued a final rule providing banking organizations with a three-year phase-in of the day one adjustment. The phase-in is similar to the one that is being proposed for the board's consideration this morning. The OBA's final rule did not directly raise or lower the leverage limit applicable to banking organizations. However, the preamble specifies that the rule's goal was to effectively modify the capital ratios for purposes of capital adequacy oversight. The limitation on the amount of the change to the net worth ratio does not apply to this proposed rule. Following the lead of the other banking agencies, the proposed rule would not modify the net worth ratios for any PCA category. Applying this element would be impracticable and would frustrate the purposes of the statutory provision. While the effect of the proposed regulatory amendments will be to adjust the calculation of the net worth ratio, the actual numeric threshold amount will remain the same. In accordance with the statutory consultation requirements, the NCUA has briefed relevant staff of the other banking agencies of the content and purposes of this proposed rule. With respect to the rule's provisions regarding smaller credit unions, Section 202 of the Federal Credit Union Act provides an exception to GAAP compliance for federally insured credit unions with total assets of less than $10 million unless otherwise prescribed by the board or an appropriate state supervisor. Section 702.402 of the board's regulations require that charges for loan losses be made in accordance with GAAP and does not distinguish based on the asset size of the credit union. In effect, Section 702.402 
exercises the board's discretion under Section 202 of the Act to override the exception for smaller credit unions by, by prescribing regulation. Under the proposed rule, the board would elect to once again exercise its discretion and adopt the gap exemption that is provided under the FCU Act. I will now return the presentation to Allison, who will discuss the, mecha the mechanics of the proposed phase-in. Thank you, Ariel. Under the proposed phase-in, the NCUA would deem retained earnings and total assets as reported on the call report to be increased by 100% of the day one adjustment during the first three quarters of calendar year 2023. And a credit union may use the first three quarters to build capital. Beginning with the fourth quarter call report of 2023, retained earnings and total assets would be deemed increased by 67% of the Cecil day one adjustment. This percentage would be decreased to 33% beginning with the fourth quarter call report in calendar year 2024. And then commencing with the fourth quarter call report in calendar year 2025, the credit union's net worth ratio will be completely reflect, reflective of the day one effects of Cecil. Eligible credit unions would not have the option of electing whether to opt into or out of the transition provisions. Although this differs from the other banking agency's rule, it is consistent with the goal of this rulemaking to mitigate disruptions caused by Cecil adoption. We believe that requiring credit unions to affirmative, affirmatively opt into the transition provisions would constitute an unnecessary administrative exercise. Automatic implementation of the phase-in by the NCUA will help to ensure its uniform application and that its benefits are provided to the greatest possible number of eligible credit unions. The final rule issued by the other banking agencies relies on banking organizations to calculate the phase-in amounts. In contrast, the NCUA will make the required phase-in calculation. As above, we believe that this will help to ensure the uniform implementation of the phase-in, as well as facilitate the accurate calculation of the transition amounts. This concludes our prepared remarks. We are glad to answer any questions you may have. Thank you both for your presentation this morning. Regulatory reform for credit use has been among my top priorities from the beginning of my term as chairman. You've often heard me say that regulation should be effective but not excessive. The need for such reforms has grown, grown even more urgent in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic and the associated economic slowdown. Relief from burdensome regulations is essential to ensure that credit unions can continue lending and providing other services to their member owners. The proposed CISO change has raised serious questions in the credit union industry, as well as among smaller financial services providers, as it would entail greater complexity, higher costs, and a significantly heavier compliance burden while bringing little additional benefit to the institutions. Numerous industry leaders have shared with me their concerns about the potential impact of the new standard on the industry, especially on smaller institutions that work in underserved communities. I've listened and shared those concerns with FASB leaders. Initially, the NCRA determined that phasing in the effects of the CECL standard Delaying full implementation in January 2023 would give credit unions more time to prepare. Our goal was to provide relief to credit unions that could see relatively large increases to their loan loss reserves when the new accounting standard became effective. However, that was before the COVID-19 pandemic struck earlier this year. As such, it is unwise to impose a burdensome and costly new regulation on credit unions especially smaller institutions in underserved areas at such a time of great challenge as this. As I've noted previously, I believe the compliance costs associated with implementing CECL overwhelmingly exceed the benefits. Credit unions may experience a negative impact on their net worth as a result of CECL implementation. The CECL standard also ignores the continued resource constraints and data system challenges faced by many credit unions in relation to the rest of the financial services sector. In our current environment, I'm especially concerned that adopting CISO will have a chilling effect on lending, 
including loans to low to moderate income borrowers and those borrowers of modest means. Although FASB enabled credit unions to delay implementation of CECL until January 1, 2023, the additional time credit unions were afforded to collect data, review data systems, and analyze models is now critically needed to support the credit and depository needs of their member owners. As a result, I have written to Chairman Golden of FASB respectfully urging that FASB provide a permanent exemption of CISO implementation for credit unions. I hope FASB will act. But if they do not, the proposed regulatory amendments will mitigate the adverse consequences of the capital adjustments resulting from CISO. The proposed rule will also exercise the board's statutory authority to exempt small credit unions with less than $10 million in assets from GAAP. Under the current circumstances, imposing the new CISO standard during such a time of economic upheaval would create additional risk for credit unions that could negatively affect their ability to serve their member owners. Our focus now should be on crafting policy solutions that encourage lending, strengthening small businesses, and entrepreneurship opportunities, as well as creating the conditions for an ultimate recovery from this economic shock. This is the prudent and appropriate course during this unprecedented, unprecedentedly difficult and challenging time. I do now have a few quick questions. It's my understanding that in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the banking agencies have provided an additional extension for implementing CESL. Is the proposed rule consistent with the action being taken by the banking agencies? Uh, this is Ariel Pereira, Mr. Chairman, and I'm happy to address that question. On, on March 31st, the other banking agencies issued an interim final rule uh, that further delayed the estimated impact of the day one adjustment on banking organizations that have already adopted or will be adopting CECL during calendar year 2020. The interim final rule does not replace the three-year transition option in the, banking agency, in the banking agency's February 14, 2019 final rule. Uh, that rule remains available to any banking organization at the time that it adopts CECL. Our proposed rule is consistent um, with the action taken by the other banking agencies. Smaller reporting companies and non-public business entities uh, are not required to implement CECL until 2022. Unless banking organizations are falling into these two categories, are early adopters of CISO in 2020, they will only receive the benefit of the three-year transition provided in the February 14, 2019 final rule. This places these banking organizations in a similar position to credit unions eligible for the three-year transition provided under our proposed rule. Um, that concludes our response, and uh, back to you, Mr. Chairman. Great, thank you, Ariel. I also understand that the CARES Act addressed CISO implementation how does this provision impact credit unions? This is Allison. Thank you for your question, Mr. Chairman. Section 4014-4014 of the CARES Act suspended mandatory compliance with CECL between March 27, 2020, the date of enactment of the CARES Act, and the earlier of the date on which the national emergency concerning the COVID-19 outbreak declared by the President terminates or December 31st, 2020. This provision does not apply to almost any federally insured credit union. As noted, credit unions are not required to begin compliance with CECL until January 1st, 2023, and a very small number have adopted it early voluntarily. Thank you. Returning to you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, great, thank you. Allison, I do have just one final question. Will credit unions that elect to adopt CISO prior to the December 15, 2022 date, would they be effective, uh, be eligible for the phased-in approach? This is Allison again. I can answer that question. Actually, an early adopter credit union is presumed to have undertaken all of the necessary analysis to determine the impact of the day one adjustment and to have made its decisions accordingly. As a result, we do not believe that the phase in is either necessary or appropriate for early adopters. Thank you for your question. Returning to you, Mr. Chairman. Great, thank you. I have no further questions, but before I turn it over to Board Member Harper, I'd like to thank him for his bipartisan outreach efforts to my office 
and wanting to ensure that we had this CISO rulemaking on our agenda today. So I want to thank him for sharing the same concerns that I had about CISO and its implementation, but more importantly for, again, reaching out for us to get us all to work together in tandem to bring it before the board today. With that being said, Board Member Harper, you are recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am, as you noted, very pleased that we have brought this matter up for consideration. And thank you, Allison and Ariel, uh, for preparing and presenting the proposed rule on the transition to the current expected credit losses uh, standard, often referred to as CECL accounting methodology. I am, um, because we should mitigate the day one adverse effects on regulatory capital, that may result from the adoption of the CECL accounting methodology, I have called for action for several months on a phase-in. This rulemaking is similar to the CECL implementation regulations issued by the other federal banking agencies last year and, as discussed today, permissible under the Federal Credit Union Act. As the proposal lays out, the effects of the proposed phase-in on a federally insured credit union's net worth calculations are consistent with Section 216 of the law and closely modeled on the CECL transition provisions included by and issued by the other banking agencies. Specifically, the proposed rule is narrowly tailored to temporarily mitigate the impacts of CECL adoption on the prompt corrective action classification of a federally insured credit union's net worth. Further, this proposed rule does not adjust the numeric net worth ratios under the MCUA system of prompt corrective action. The sole purpose of the proposed phase-in is to give federally insured credit unions some time to adjust to the new GAAP standards adopted by the Financial Accounting Standards Board in a uniform manner and without disrupting their ability to serve their members. Taken together, Estimating expected credit losses over the life of an asset under CECL, including consideration of reasonable and supportable forecasts, but without applying the probable threshold that exists under the incurred loss methodology, results in earlier recognition of credit losses. Earlier recognition of credit losses, in my view, is a good thing. Our Office of General Counsel has also added language within the proposed rule clarifying that states may elect to impose GAAP standards on small credit unions with less than $10 million in assets that fall within their jurisdiction. This change in what we were originally planning to put forward results from an issue raised during the NCUA's consultation with state regulators and it is helpful to clarify the language to reflect the input of our state partners and supervision. Allison, I do have several questions for you about the practical effect of CECL on credit unions. Upon the implementation of CECL, what will happen to a credit union if there is a swing in retained earnings and the credit union drops by more than one prompt corrective action category? Well, sir, although unlikely based on current data models that we are running each quarter, but for those credit unions who do drop, they will need to submit a net worth restoration plan per our regulation. We will be committed to helping them through their CECL transition and will be supportive of any reasonable plans that help to build capital. That said, now is the time to begin building capital in anticipation of CECL, and as the proposed rule is written, there will be three additional quarters to build capital after implementation in 2023. Thank you for your question. Returning back to you. Um, Allison, um, on that point, when we had our briefing before today's board meeting, you had done some analysis with your team um, with respect to of the 50, nearly 5,200 credit unions that we have within the credit union system, how many would uh, see a change? And I believe that the vast majority of them in your analysis said that you would have no change. Am I remembering that correctly? Yes, sir, you are. Um, of the 
Freight unions that reported in March of the I've got March uh, quarterly uh, data. Sure. Uh, though the for uh, under prompt corrective action now there were 5,146 credit unions that are well or adequately capitalized, and with a 30 percent basis point shock to the allowance and placed into retained earnings, that number changes to 5,136 between those two categories, so only a, a change of 10 credit unions. Thank you for that explanation. It really helps to assure me that there will be little exposure to the share insurance fund if we finalize this proposal. Allison, what happens to Cecil accounting methodology when a credit union acquires the assets and customers of a bank through a merger? Well, actually, not much, as any adjustment to Cecil would be considered a subsequent measurement to the transaction. GAAP requires a credit union to follow the purchase accounting rules, and therefore, the assets and liabilities of the bank must be fair valued. So the loans at acquisition are measured at fair value, and those fair value measurements are placed on the balance sheet the day of acquisition, and any CECL adjustments to those loans would occur after the transaction has been consummated. Thank you for your question. Uh, and thank you, Allison. My next question is on a slightly different matter, but a matter in which I often hear from credit unions when I get into the field. What are the NCUA's plans for examiner training and credit union education on the CECL methodology? That's a great question, sir. So before COVID, I had been out on the conference circuit, often partnering with FASB staff, speaking to credit unions about CECL. FASB is committed for more education through roundtables, and they anticipate starting them up again, albeit virtually layered in the fall. And I, and I help them when they're speaking to credit unions on their agenda. We also have our NCUA website with a web page dedicated to CECL. This page has many CECL resources, including the newly published interagency statement and all of the FAQs. As for examination staff, we will prepare for examiner training beginning next year. Examiners, too, have the ability to read the interagency statement our FAQs, and review all of the resources on our public-facing web page. Thank you. And, and thank you, Allison, um, uh, for that. Um, I do believe that we need to be increasing our education efforts this year to help credit unions understand uh, what is going to happen. And, and I, the last question I have is, I know you've talked about simplified methods for compliance for smaller credit unions um, with CECL. Uh, there's the reasonable and supportable method. There's also the weighted average remaining maturity method. Will credit unions need to hire uh, a high-priced econometrician or consultants to implement CECL, or is this something that the vast majority of credit unions can do on their own? Uh, again, another great question. Uh, no, as you just said, credit unions can use simple methods such as the weighted average remaining maturity or the warm method to calculate their CECL allowance. And this method can easily be done in a spreadsheet and requires no consultant or an economist. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And I assume that we will be training our examiners to look at that and to analyze that so uh, that credit unions shouldn't necessarily feel that NCUA is going to apply some different standard. Is that the case, Allison? That is correct. That is correct. Great. Great. Allison, I appreciate your comprehensive responses to each of my questions. And thank you again, Allison and Ariel, for the excellent work that went into this proposal. Mr. Chairman, I will support this proposed rule and have no further comments. Thank you, Mr. Harper. I'd now like to recognize Board Member McWaters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it's important to start with a, a little bit of history here. Approaching two years ago, Larry Fazio, Allison Clark, and I along with representatives of the banking agencies, met with the chair, the then chair of the Financial Accounting Standards Board, Russ Golden, and the principal architect of the proposed current expected credit loss rule, House Roter. 
I noted to Mr. Gold and Mr. Schroeder that there were a number of approaches to addressing our concerns with the proposed Cecil rule. For example, among other responses, the FASB could exempt credit unions and other community financial institutions from the rule, recast the rule in a less burdensome manner, or simply delay the implementation of the rule for further analysis. We also know that Congress could act to modify Cecil or to overrule its implementation. While no doubt worthy of consideration, these approaches were substantially outside the jurisdiction of the NCUA. My goal for the meeting was not merely to rehash what everyone already knew, but to make actual progress on the development of a realistic approach to reducing the burden on credit unions from the implementation of CECL while maintaining the integrity of audited financial statements and the regulatory capital determinations relied upon by the NCUA for safety and soundness purposes. During the meeting and in follow-up communications, I outlined two fundamental challenges presented by the proposed CECL rule. One, the projected compliance costs for credit unions and other community financial institutions in administering CECL was excessively and disproportionately burdensome given the size, complexity, and risk presented by these financial institutions. And two, the day one charge to regulatory capital triggered by the implementation of CECL would inappropriately decrease capital without justifying a justifying commensurate increase in the loan loss risk applicable to credit unions and the share insurance fund. Far from a mere technical accounting change, this reduction in capital would most likely lead to a restriction in the ability of credit unions to make loans and extend credit to their members. Regarding the first item, the FASB has taken helpful steps to allay some of the financial burdens associated with implementing CECL. Fortunately, under this guidance, many community financial institutions are no longer charged with retaining the services of expensive economists and financial consultants in calculating the loan loss reserves under CECL. This common sense approach reflects the relative simplicity and transparency of the loan portfolios held by credit unions and other community financial institutions. Concerning the second issue, I initially proposed that the NCUA permit credit unions to amortize their day one CECL charge over a 10-year period and not the three-year term we are proposing today. Although the longer amortization period parallels prior standards employed by the FASB, the banking agencies adopted the much shorter three-year amortization period, and due to statutory constraints, we may not exceed that time frame. While no doubt a benefit, I would have preferred a longer amortization period of the day one charge for credit unions and other community financial institutions. Although we have made some progress concerning the structure and implementation of CECL, at the end of the day, the rule serves as an exceedingly complex mechanism by which to increase loan loss reserves. Given the dramatically adverse economic fallout from the Great Recession, CECL offers an unsurprising approach for the FASB to mandate for the too big to fail in other significant and mid-tier financial institutions. The trickle down of this tedious and costly rule to credit unions and other community financial institutions, however, is far more problematic. Surely, from my perspective as a CPA for over 40 years, there's a simpler and more elegant approach by which to reflect the audited financial statements of these institutions in accordance with GAAP and without impairing regulatory capital or safety and soundness. Without diminishing the significance of the foregoing, I will support today's proposal as it permits credit unions to amortize the day one accounting charge 
over a three-year period instead of absorbing all of the charge directly into regulatory capital on day one. In the interim, I encourage the NCUA to work with the banking agencies and the FASB to craft a credit loss rule that is specifically tailored and targeted to the loan loss risk actually presented by credit unions and other community financial institutions. Otherwise, CECL may have a chilling effect on the ability of these institutions to extend loans and other credit to their members and customers. Ironically, this burden will fall disproportionately on those who were the absolutely least responsible for the Great Recession, the underserved, the unserved, and those economically challenged and of modest means. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I have no questions. Thank you, Board Member McWater. Is there a motion? Yes, sir. I move that the Board approve proposed rule, Part 702 of NCUA's Rules and Regulations for a 60-day comment period as attached to the Board Action Memorandum. Is there a second to the motion? This is Board Member Harper. I second the motion. There is a sufficient second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it, and let the record show the motion pass three to zero. The third item on today's agenda is proposed rule part 701.6, fees paid by federal credit unions. Staff presenting, Eugene Sheed, Chief Financial Officer, Jim Holm, Supervisory Budget Analyst, Office of the Chief Financial Officer, and Ian Marina, Associate General Counsel, Office of the General Counsel. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Hood, Board Member McWaters, and Board Member Harper. This is Eugene Sheed, and I'll be uh, doing the remarks this morning, and uh, Jim uh, and uh, uh, is on for uh, uh, questions if uh, they come up. Um, for your consideration is a draft notice of proposed rulemaking that would revise the NCUA's regulation that governs the calculation of an annual operating fees that are billed to federal credit unions, or FCUs. If you approve, uh, this draft proposed rule will be published in the Federal Register with a 60-day comment period. The draft proposal would make several changes to the NCUA's current regulation, which is published at Title 12 of the Code of Federal Regulations at Section 701.6. First, for purposes of calculating the annual operating fee, the draft proposal would amend the current rule to extend uh, or to exclude from total assets any loan in FCU reports under the Small Business Administration's Paycheck Protection Program, or PPP, or similar future program approved uh, for exclusion by the NCUA Board. Second, the draft proposal would delete from the current regulation references to the Credit Union System Investment Program and the Credit Union Homeowners Affordability Relief Program, both of which no longer exist. Third, the draft proposal would amend the period used for calculating in FCU's total assets. And finally, the draft proposal would make some minor technical changes to the current structure of the regulation. The NCUA's current rule sets out the basis on which the NCUA assesses the annual operating fee and provides that federal credit unions must pay the NCUA an annual operating fee based on the credit union's total assets. Operating fee payments are due from FCUs in April of each year and the NCUA currently prepares invoices using reported total assets from the prior year's December call report. The term total assets for the purposes of the operating fee presently includes all assets with certain exclusions reported on an FCU's call report as of December 31st of the prior year. The draft proposal's first change would be to modify how the current rule excludes certain assets from the calculation of a credit union's total assets. The coronavirus aid, relief, 
Economic Security Act, or CARES Act, authorized the Small Business Administration, or SBA, to create a loan guarantee program, the Paycheck Protection Program, to help certain businesses affected by the COVID pandemic's economic impacts. Provide cre provided credit union lenders comply with the applicable lender obligations set forth in the SBA's interim final rule, the SBA will fully guarantee loans issued under the PPP backed by the full faith and credit of the United States. Most federally insured credit unions are eligible to make PPP loans to members, and many of them already have. Following enactment of the CARES Act, the Board issued an interim final rule to make several amendments to NCUA's regulations relating to PPP loans. Of most relevance to this draft proposal, an April 27, 2020 interim final rule provided that if a covered PPP loan made by a federally insured credit union is pledged as collateral for a non-recourse loan that is provided as part of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System's PPP liquidity facility, the covered loan can be excluded from the credit union's calculation of total assets for the purposes of calculating the net worth ratio. That change applied only to the calculation of the net worth ratio and not to other requirements or calculations in the NCUA's regulations that depend on a credit union's total assets. At present, an FCU must report the value of all of its PPP loans in its call reports, whether the FCU originated the loans, purchased them from the secondary market, or has pledged them uh, to the Federal Reserve liquidity facility. The value of PPP loans reported in the call report could therefore increase the total asset uh, amounts the NCUA uses to compute the annual operating fee due. Under the NCUA's current operating fee regulation, the FCU's PPP loans may be subject may subject the FCU to a higher operating fee, and this may impose a burden for participation in this program or a disincentive to participate now that the program has been extended. The draft proposal would amend the current operating fee rule by excluding all PPP loans from an FCU's total assets for the purposes of calculating its annual operating fee. Under this draft proposal, FCUs would continue to report their assets in quarterly call reports. The purpose, for purposes of determining the operating fee, however, the NCUA would exclude the reported PPP loans in the calculation of total assets. This change will ensure that FCUs interested in making PPP loans do not bear greater financial burden for doing so since the PPP serves an important public purpose. Excluding PPP loans from the calculation of total assets is similar to an amendment the Board made to the calculation of total assets uh, in a 2009 final rule encouraging FCUs to participate in the credit union system investment program uh, known as CUSIP or the credit and the credit union Homeowner Affordability Relief Program, CU HARP. Investment in these programs was excluded from the computations for total assets for purposes of the operating fee because the instruments were guaranteed by the Share Insurance Fund, posed no credit risk to the participating credit unions, and the exclusion was intended to encourage greater participation rates in the programs with a clear public benefit. CU SIP ended in 2010. Similarly, CU HARP investments were issued by U.S. Central Federal Credit Union, and all of those investments matured prior to the credit union's liquidation in 2012. Because these programs no longer exist and have no remaining investments, the draft proposal would delete uh, them, uh, uh, current references to them in the regulation. Also, given the potential for additional programs similar to PPP to arise in the near future or as a result of future economic situations. The draft proposal also includes regulatory language that would allow the board to exclude similar future programs without making regulatory changes. Instead of being required to amend NCUA's rules to add specific references to possible future programs, the board could issue an order to exclude them, which could be published in a letter to FCUs or similar notice. 
This change would provide the board with flexibility to consider excluding assets related to future programs that may develop on short notice, particularly in cases that we're including such assets in the operating fee calculation may create a disincentive to FCUs to participate. The other important change in the draft proposal would alter the current rule, uh, uh, current rule to use the average of the FCUs for most recently reported quarterly assets as the basis for calculating the annual operating fee dues. <clears throat> as I mentioned at the opening, the NCOA currently bills FCUs their operating fee based on total assets reported uh, in the December 31st year-end call report. Because the NCOA budget and associated operating fee rates are approved before the December call report data is available, the Chief Financial Officer uses projected FCU assets to set the operating fee rates. Therefore, if the actual total assets reported in the December call report are below the projected asset growth used for setting the operating fee rates, the NCUA will collect less in operating fee revenue than is required to support the budget approved by the board. Conversely, if total assets reported in the December call report are greater than projected, the NCUA may wind up collecting more than is required to support the board approved budget. The draft proposal would base the operating fee invoices on the average of the FCU's four most recent call reports available at the time the board approves the budget in the forthcoming year. The change to the four-quarter average reduces the risk that the NCUA will either under or over collect operating fee relative to the board approved budget. The change will also reduce the effect of seasonal fluctuations uh, in the total assets of FCUs and will provide more certainty to FCUs about their operating uh, fee charges for the forthcoming year. Because mergers between FCUs and other financial institutions and conversions of non-FCUs to federal charters can occur at any time during the year, the draft proposal also includes specific guidelines for how such transactions will be treated for the purposes of calculating the operating fee due uh, from the continuing FCU. Finally, the draft proposal makes some modest technical changes to the existing rule, which are described in greater detail in the draft proposal. In closing, I would like to thank the staff of the CFO's office and the Office of General Counsel who have worked very diligently and collaboratively uh, to develop this draft proposal. I recommend your approval to publish uh, these proposed changes in the Federal Register, and I am ready to answer any questions that you may have. Great. Thank you for your presentation, Eugene. Eugene officially became our Chief Financial Officer last week, taking the place of Rendell Jones, who moved up to become the Deputy Executive Director and Chief Operating Officer. To that end, I'd like to congratulate you, Eugene, and say to you how much I look forward to your continued efforts and guidance on budgetary items at the NCUA. And again, heartfelt congratulations. Title 12, Section 701.6 of the Code of Federal Regulations, which is titled Fees Paid by Federal Credit Unions, is the regulation that governs NCUA's calculation of the annual operating fees billed to federal credit unions. I asked our office of the Chief Financial Officer to review the operating fee rule after the board made regulatory changes earlier this spring to exclude Paycheck Protection Program loans when calculating credit unions' net worth ratios. It is therefore only logical that the board ensures the NCUA treats PPP loans consistently with its other regulations for purposes of calculating the operating fee. Fortuitously, determining how to exclude PPP loans from the operating fee coincided with the normal review cycle for the operating fee rule. The Office of the Chief Financial Officer and the Office of General Counsel have developed several other revisions to the operating fee rule intended to keep the checks up to date and ensure equitable treatment of all federal credit unions that pay an operating fee. I now have a few quick questions. Eugene, from your presentation, I understand that the proposal would change our calculation of a credit union's total assets from four-quarter call reports filed to the average of four 
call reports. Why do you recommend this change, and is there a benefit to federal credit unions when we use a four-quarter average? Uh, sure. Um, thank you. The, so we currently, when we construct the fee schedule as part of the annual budget process, we have to make a projection as to what the year-end assets uh, are going to be. Uh, because the current regulation says that it will be based on the December 31 call report, which uh, we don't get until after we've uh, first set the budget and second already estimated or developed the fee schedule. Um, so this would eliminate some of that guesswork because right now we have to we work with the uh, Office of the Chief Economist to make a projection as to what that'll be. And of course, they're subject to either being too low or too high. Um, and this does a couple of things. One, if, if we guess... Uh, too low in terms of the size of the industry um, for December 31st, we would wind up slightly under collecting uh, the amount that we need to support the budget approved by the board. And likewise, conversely, if we um, collected, if assets grew by a rate greater than we had anticipated, we'd actually wind up uh, collecting a bit too much. Um, so this takes out some of that guesswork. Um, and also by switching over to the four quarters for credit unions that see some seasonality in their assets, um, this will smooth out seasonality versus just basing it on a single single quarter's estimate. That uh, concludes my remarks to that question. Great. Thank you, Eugene. And I do have one final question for you. In your presentation, you explained how the draft proposal would exclude PPP loans from the operating fee calculations, which is, of course, a change that I support. But you also mentioned that the rule increased the board's flexibility to exclude other similar future programs. Could you explain a little bit more about this type of flexibility? Uh, sure, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you're correct that the draft proposal includes a revised language that provides that the board would have the ability to exclude future programs uh, from the calculation of total assets uh, used when determining the operating fee much like we're um, discussing today for the PPP program. Uh, the proposed rule would, but it wouldn't require uh, the board to exclude uh, future such programs without having to go back through and make changes to the text of the rule. Um, and we brought this forward as a proposal because we believe that uh, the flexibility is appropriate given the fast-moving nature of the modern economy in the recent experience, not only with the PPP loans, uh, but to similar experiences that I mentioned uh, that we had in responding to the uh, 2008 financial crisis. And that concludes my remarks to that question. Thank you once again. And now I will turn the floor over to Board Member Harper. Mr. Harper, you're recognized. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I join you in congratulating Eugene on his promotion. Uh, I think he's going to serve the agency very well. And thank you also to uh, Jim and Ann for your work on this proposed rule to modify the calculation of the annual operating fee that the NCUA assesses federal credit unions. As noted in your presentation earlier, um, noted in your presentation earlier this year, the NCUA board excluded loans made through the Paycheck Protection Program from the determination of a credit union's net worth ratio. However, we did not make changes to our other regulatory requirements or administrative calculations that depend on a credit union's total assets. As the Paycheck Protection Program advances an important public policy goal, we should exclude such loans from the calculation of the operating fee. These loans are meant to help Main Street small businesses and their employees to withstand the economic fallout related to the COVID-19 pandemic. We do not want to impose a burden on credit unions for participating in the Small Business Administration's program or a disincentive to participate now that Congress has extended the program. Additionally, I agree with the proposed recommendation that the four-quarter average of total assets is more equitable overall because it can account for seasonal share account fluctuations that some federal credit unions experience. In sum, I will support the issuance of this proposed rule on credit union operating fees. I look forward to reviewing the comments that we will receive. Mr. Chairman, I have no questions and no additional comments at this time. Thank you, Mr. Harper. I'd now like to recognize Board Member McWaters. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no specific questions on this. It's exceedingly uh, technical. I encourage um, the community and other interested persons to read it, reflect on it, and let us know what you, you think. That's very, very important. Um, and Eugene, congratulations. I've worked with Eugene since he came to the NCUA, and particularly in my capacity as a board member over at NeighborWorks America. I am chair of the audit committee there. Eugene and Trey are the people who helped me out, and trust me, <laughs> Without them, I would be lost about half the time. They are fantastic. And welcome to your new job, and um, I wish you the best. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Great. Thank you, Mr. McWaters. Is there a motion? Yes, this is Board Member Harper. I move that the Board approve proposed rule, Part 701, Point six of the NCUA's rule and regulations for a 60-day comment period as attached to the board action memorandum. Is there a second to the motion? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. I second that motion. There is a sufficient second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. The ayes have it and let the record show the motion passed three to zero. The fourth item on our agenda today is request for comment, overhead transfer rate and operating fee methodology. Staff presented, Eugene Sheed, Chief Financial Officer. Jim Holm, Supervisory Budget Analyst, Office of the Chief Financial Officer. And Ian Marina, Associate General Counsel, Office of General Counsel. Welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. This is uh, Eugene Sheed, also uh, participating in the presentation uh, this morning with me, I believe, will be uh, Victoria Narwhal, the Director of the Division of Risk Management in E&I, and she, I think, is going to open by giving us an overview of the overhead transfer rate uh, part of the methodology discussion for this morning. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Hood. Board Member McWaters and Board Member Harper. This is Vicki Narwald, the E&I Director of Risk Management. I'm here today with my colleagues from the Office of the Chief Financial Officer and the Office of General Counsel to prevent, present for your consideration a draft notice and request for comment about the methodology used to compute the overhead transfer rate, also referred to as the OTR and the methodology used to determine the annual schedule of operating fees billed to federal credit unions. If you approve, this document will be published in the Federal Register with a 60-day comment period. In the interest of transparency and dialogue with stakeholders in the credit union system, the NCUA publishes notices about these methodologies despite the fact that there is no legal requirement for doing so. In today's presentation, I will provide an overview of the methodology for calculating the OTR, for which there are no proposed changes, and about which we ask for comments from stakeholders. My colleagues from the Office of the Chief Financial Officer will summarize the modifications proposed to the methodology for setting annual operating fees, as well as explain a few questions we ask of stakeholders about how the operating fee is determined. As established in the Federal Credit Union Act, there are two primary sources for the NCUA's annual budget. One, requisitions from the Share Insurance Fund, which we refer to as the OTR, and two, operating fees charged to federal credit unions. The first budget funding source, the OTR, represents the formula the NCUA uses to allocate insurance-related expenses to the Share Insurance Fund. Two statutory provisions directly limit the board's discretion with respect to the OTR. First, expenses funded from the Share Insurance Fund must carry out the purposes of Title II of the Act, which relate to share insurance. Second, the NCUA may not fund its entire annual budget through charges to the Share Insurance Fund. The draft notice before you 
provides a history of how the NCUA developed its OTR methodology. In the interest of time, I will describe only our current approach to calculating the OTR. Since 2017, the NCUA has, a, has used a simplified OTR methodology based on four principles that assign a percentage share of work to insurance costs in the following four categories. The first category, 50% insurance related, includes activities and time spent examining and supervising federal credit unions. The second category, 100% insurance related, includes all time and costs the NCUA spends supervising or evaluating the risks posed by federally insured state chartered credit unions or other entities the NCUA does not charter or regulate, such as third-party vendors and credit union service organizations. The third category, 0% insurance related, includes the time and costs related to the NCUA's role as charterer and enforcer of consumer protection and other non-insurance-based laws governing the operation of credit unions, for example, field of membership requirements. And the fourth category, 100% insurance related, includes time and costs related to the NCUA's role in administering federal share insurance and the share insurance fund. To calculate the OTR, the four principles are applied to the activities and costs of the agency to arrive at the portion of the agency's budget to be charged to the share insurance fund. I will now describe the steps the staff in the Office of Examination and Insurance carry out to apply the principles. Step one is the workload program. Annually, the NCUA develops a workload budget based on the agency's examination and supervision program to carry out the agency's core mission. The workload budget reflects the time necessary to examine and supervise federally insured credit unions along with other related activities, and therefore the level of field staff needed to implement the exam program. Applying principles one, two, and three, that is, the principles relevant to the workload program, or excuse me, the workload budget, to the applicable elements of the workload budget result in a composite rate that reflects the portion of the agency's overall insurance-related mission program activities. Step two, the annual budget. The annual budget represents the cost of the activities associated with achieving the strategic goals and objectives set forth in the NCUA's strategic plan. The annual budget is based on agency priorities and initiatives that drive resulting resource needs and, needs and allocations. The agency achieves its primary mission through the examination and supervision program. The percentage of insurance-related workload hours derived from step one represents the main allocation factor used in step two and is applied to the budgets for the examination and supervision programs to calculate the insurance-related costs of the offices conducting field work, which are currently the regions and ones. A few agency offices have roles distinct enough to warrant their own allocation factors which are developed by applying the four principles I described to their distinctive activities. Each of these offices track their activities annually to determine their allocation factors. These factors are then applied to the respective offices' budgets to determine their insurance-related costs. A weighted average allocation factor calculated by dividing the aggregate insurance-related costs for the field offices conducting the examination and supervision program and the agency offices with their own unique allocation factors by their aggregate total budgets is applied to the central offices that design or oversee the examination and supervision program or support the agency's overall operations. This factor is then applied to the aggregate budgets for the remaining offices. As such, the proportion of insurance-related activities for these offices corresponds to that of the mission offices. The NCUA's total insurance-related costs are calculated by summing 
the insurance cost calculated for the field offices, the offices with unique allocation factors, and the insurance cost for all other NCUA offices. Step three, calculate the OTR. The OTR is calculated by dividing the total insurance-related costs determined in step two by the NCUA's total annual budget. In this way, the OTR represents the percentage of the NCUA budget funded by a transfer from the share insurance fund. This principles-based OTR methodology has streamlined the process for calculating the OTR and reduced the resources needed to gather the cost center time allocation used in the calculation. In addition, the methodology established more consistency in the calculated OTR each year. Compared to past methodologies, the streamlined and simplified approach to calculating the OTR has provided a level trend in the OTR with only minor fluctuations due to the variables that affect the OTR. In the draft notice you have before you, we do not propose any changes to the OTR methodology at this time. We believe it is fair and equitable, more transparent, and less complex than prior methodologies has reduced administrative costs related to the OTR and recognizes that safety and soundness is not the sole domain of NCUA as insurer. Nevertheless, in the draft notice, we invite comments on our OTR methodology, specifically on the four principles I discussed in the beginning of my presentation. I will now turn the discussion over to Eugene. Thank you, Vicki. I will now discuss the second major source of funding for the NCUA's annual budget, namely the operating fees charged to federal credit unions, or FCUs. My previous uh, presentation uh, to you a few minutes ago I discussed proposed changes to the operating fee that are contained in Section 701.6. This part of the discussion will focus on the methodology approach used to determine the annual schedule of operating fees charged to FCUs. Like Vicki mentioned earlier in her comments about the OTR methodology, the draft notice before you provides a detailed history of the NCUA's operating fee methodology that I will not cover this morning uh, in the interest of time. I will provide a brief description of the current methodology for calculating the operating fee and then discuss our proposed modifications. As you know, the board adopts an annual budget in the fall of each year, which includes an operating budget for the cost of the day-to-day -day operations such as employee compensation, travel and training expenses, support purchased through contracts with service providers that have expertise outside of the agency's core capabilities, and other miscellaneous administrative expenses. The annual budget also includes funds for capital projects, such as for computer hardware and software, uh, for agency investments in owned real estate and other equipment. To determine the aggregate share of the annual budget that will be funded uh, through the operating fee, the staff in the CFO's office apply the current operating fee methodology generally in two steps. Step one, we reduce the annual budget by the amounts that do not have to be billed to the FCUs uh, that pay the operating fee. Specifically, we subtract from the operating budget the amounts expected to be transferred from the share insurance fund through the OTR that Vicki just described. We also subtract other expected income, which is projected based on the latest financial statements and includes interest income in miscellaneous revenue. Interest income includes interest on the operating fund balances that we invest in short-term treasury securities because the funds are not immediately required to pay operating expenses. Other income includes miscellaneous revenue, such as revenue from the production or sale of NCUA reports and publications, rents collected from other federal agencies that use NCUA facilities, and parking fees from the agency share of the parking garage underneath the NCUA central office building. In step two, we add to the budget amounts not currently subject to the OTR or immediately reimbursed by the OTR. Specifically, 
Budgets for capital projects and notes payable are added to the balance remaining after deducting the estimated OTR and other income from the operating budget. Amounts added for capital acquisitions are based on a rigorous annual assessment of the agency's needs for information technology, facility improvements and repair, or other multi-year capital investments. Amounts added for notes payable represent the annual payment of the 30-year secure term note initiated in 1992 when the share insurance, with the share insurance fund to pay for the cost of constructing the NCUA's central office building. The result after all adjustments is the total budget that's subject to operating fee and payable by both natural person and corporate FCUs. The natural person FCU operating fees are determined by deducting the corporate FCU's operating fee share from the total budget operating fee requirements. The draft, notice proposes, the draft notice proposes no changes to the corporate FCU operating fees. The current fee schedule for natural person FCU uses a three, uh, three asset tiers. The different assessment, rates, uh, different assessment rates are applied to each tier, and the threshold for each tier is adjusted annually to reflect growth in the credit union system. Federal credit unions with $1 million or less in assets pay no operating fee. There are two steps used to determine the adjustments to the operating fee schedule for the upcoming year. <clears throat> they are first updating the prior year asset tier thresholds by using projected asset growth rates, and second updating the prior year assessment rates for each asset tier by determining the average assessment rate adjustment. The first step in determining the new operating fee schedule is to increase the threshold for each asset tier from the prior year by projected asset growth. Tier thresholds are adjusted annually to preserve the same relative relationship of the scale uh, to the applicable asset base. Currently, the NCUA Office of the Chief Economist projects FCU asset growth rates for the year, and a draft notice provides a detailed explanation of the growth model. Uh, the CFO's office staff applies the growth projections to the current operating fee thresholds to determine the upcoming year's uh, thresholds. After updating the asset tier thresholds, the next step is to project the operating fees using the updated asset tier thresholds and the prior year assessment rates charged for each tier. The percentage difference between the projected operating fee calculation and the operating fee uh, collections required to support the budget is the average rate adjustment. CFO staff apply this adjustment to, the amended, to amend the prior year's assessment rates for each asset tier, either upwards or downwards. If the projected amount to the operating fee collections is expected to be less than the required budgeted amount, then the asset rates for each asset tier are adjusted upwards. Conversely, if the projected amounts of collections are more are then required to support the board approved budget, then the assessment rate for each asset tier is adjusted downwards. Next, I will discuss uh, some proposed changes. In the draft notice, we propose three changes to the operating fee methodology. Uh, first, clarifying the treatment of capital project budgets when calculating the operating fees. Second, clarifying the treatment of miscellaneous revenue when calculating the operating fees. And third, modifying the approach for calculating the annual uh, adjustment to the thresholds for the operating fee tier rates. I will now briefly describe each of these changes in some detail. The first change in the draft notice clarifies how the NCUA will treat capital project budgets for the purposes of calculating the operating fee. Currently, we fund the planned capital budget entirely through operating fees assessed to the FCUs. The draft notice proposes to change this practice by reimbursing the appropriate portion through the OTR at the time of project expenditure. The draft notice proposes to clarify that for purposes of calculating the operating fee, the budget for capital projects will be included with the total annual budget subject to the OTR. This approach ensures that the cost of new capital acquisitions is borne consistently, consistent, 
the, between the FCUs and the uh, federally insured uh, state chartered credit unions at the time of act the acquisitions are made. Under the existing methodology, the SIF reimburses the operating fund for capital projects uh, at the OTR over several years according to depreciation schedules, including capital project budgets and the total annual amount of the OTR at the point of acquisition, effectively accelerates the OTR's reimbursement for the capital projects to the time at which expenditures occur. This change also increases consistency uh, with the current OTR methodology, which generally requires that a proportionate share of expenses not exclusively related to the regulation of the FCUs be borne in part by the share insurance fund. The draft notice includes a table comparing how the operating fee calculation for the 2020 budget would have differed had the funds for the capital projects been subjected to the OTR uh, like for other parts of the uh, annual budget for that year. The second change to the operating fee methodology in the draft notice would change the treatment of miscellaneous revenue when calculating the operating fee. Currently, miscellaneous revenue collected by the NCUA reduces the operating fee charged to the FCUs. The draft notice proposes changing the treatment of miscellaneous revenue, which would reduce the percentage of the NCUA budget funded by the OTR transfer from the share insurance fund. As I previously mentioned, miscellaneous revenue includes revenue from the production and sale of NCUA reports and publications, rent collected from other agencies that use NCUA facilities, and parking fee revenues. The NCUA's miscellaneous revenues varies from year to year, but is typically approximately about a million dollars. The draft notice would clarify that for purposes of calculating the operating fee, projected miscellaneous revenue would be included with the total annual budget subjected to the OTR, thus slightly lowering the amount drawn from the OTR. This approach is consistent with the approach, the proposed change to the capital project budgets that I just mentioned, and it better reflects the equitable distribution of the agency's net expenses between the FCUs and the FISCUs. The draft notice includes a second table that compares how the operating fee calculation for the 2020 budget would have differed had miscellaneous revenue reduced the amount of the a budget funded through the OTR uh, for that year. The third change to the operating fee methodology proposed in the draft notice would modify the approach for determining the annual adjustment to the operating fee uh, asset tier thresholds. Specifically, the draft notice proposed comparing the average of the total systems assets reported in the call report for the four quarters available at the time the board approves the budget to the average of total system assets reported for the four quarters of the respective previous years. In this way, the tier threshold shown in the operating fee schedule would increase each year based on the same reporting data that will be used for computing the individual FCU's invoice amounts, uh, which is the uh, proposal I described in the previous rule. The draft notice also in includes uh, some general questions uh, about how the NCUA charges the operating fee, and we would like stakeholders to provide us uh, their views on a variety of these topics. Uh, and this includes, first, uh, we ask stakeholders to provide their views on the current three-tier operating fee schedule, which has not changed since 1993. The current fee schedule is regressive, that is, credit unions with larger amounts of total assets pay lower marginal rates on those assets above a th the thresh each threshold level as compared to the lower tiers. Given the growth and consolidation of the credit union system, we ask whether such an approach remains an equitable method for allocating the agency's operating costs and whether or how the agency should consider modifying the operating fee schedule. Second, uh, currently, uh, FCUs with less than a million dollars in total assets are not currently charged an operating fee, uh, a level that was set uh, in, uh, effective in 2013. And we ask whether that exclusion threshold should change, and if so, uh, what, to what alternate level. And finally, we ask stakeholders for views on whether credit unions that complete the NCUA's voluntary diversity self-assessment 
should receive a modest discount on operating fees due in the subsequent year or some other non-monetary benefit. This concludes my description of the sections of uh, the draft notice that relate to the operating fee, uh, and Vicki and I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Vicki and Eugene, for the very impactful and very illuminating presentation this morning. It was really insightful. This document, which we are considering for publication in the Federal Register, is part of our commitment to transparency in the NCUA's budgeting and financial management practices. If the Board approves this document, we will be asking the public to review and comment on the agency's approach to financing the NCUA's annual budget. Funds for NCUA programs come from two sources. Part is paid by the federal credit unions and other by federally insured state chartered credit unions through transfers from the share insurance fund using the overhead transfer rate. And the rest is paid through operating fees collected from federal credit unions themselves. The draft document we have before us will provide the public with an explanation of the NCUA's methodologies for computing the overhead transfer rate and annual operating fees, and includes several proposals and questions intended to improve how operating fees are assessed. I now have a few questions for you. Just to clarify, we're not proposing any specific changes to the overhead transfer rate, but we are, however, inviting interested stakeholders to provide us comments on the current methodology. Is that right? This is Vicki Narwald. I will take that question. That is correct. In 2017, the board committed to soliciting public comment on the OTR methodology at least every three years and whenever NCOA seeks to change the OTR methodology. Thank you for your question. That concludes my response. Thank you, Vicki. And from your presentation, I also understand that you're proposing to share the cost for future capital projects between federal credit unions and federally insured state chartered credit unions. Was this not the case in the past? Uh, so this is uh, Eugene, and I'll uh, take that question. Uh, so it has been the case that capital projects were paid for by both uh, the operating fee uh, and from the SIF, and, and so that element's not changing. Uh, they both will still make contribution. Uh, what would change under uh, what we're proposing here is the timing of the contribution from the SIF. Um, as I was mentioning, right now the uh, operating fee paid by the FCUs initially pays for the full capital investment up front, um, and then there's a depreciation schedule uh, on the back end uh, for the SIF. Under this proposal, uh, both would make their contribution to the capital project uh, at the time of project uh, expenditure. And that concludes my uh, answer to that question. Great. Thank you, Eugene. I do just have one final question. In your presentation, you mentioned that the proposal asked stakeholders for their perspectives on the distribution of operating fees across all federal credit unions, as well as their perspectives on the current operating fee exemption for credit unions with less than a million dollars in total assets. Do you anticipate recommending changes to either the schedule that distributes the fees across federal credit unions or modifying the exemption threshold? Well, so thank you, sir. Yes, um, that is under consideration, and we're suggesting a couple of different possibilities uh, in, in the notice that goes out, uh, some alternatives uh, for comment and consideration, uh, and we're seeking comment uh, from stakeholders on those. Uh, but at this time, we don't have a specific recommendation uh, that we're proposing, rather than just seeking input uh, to help us with the uh, decision-making process. And that's my concludes my remarks. Thank you, Eugene. As you know from our briefing sessions, I'll be eagerly awaiting those responses, especially as we look to uh, threshold exemption levels and also things around the voluntary uh, diversity assessment survey. So those are all things I look forward to eagerly reading as those comments come in. I have no further questions. I'd now like to recognize Board Member Harper. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Eugene and Vicki, for your presentation on this request for comments on the methodologies the NCUA uses to determine the overhead transfer rates and the schedule for the operating fee. The matters before us are relatively straightforward. From time to time, the NCUA board has sought comments on the calculation of the overhead transfer rate 
charged to the share insurance fund and the operating fee is charged against federal credit unions. With respect to the operating fee, we have the authority under the Federal Credit Union Act to consider the ability of federal credit unions to pay the fee. As such, in recent years, we have exempted the smallest of federal credit unions, those with total assets of $1 million or less from the fee. The system's total assets have grown considerably since 2013 when we implement, implemented the last threshold change. So it is appropriate for us now to reconsider that small credit union threshold. In this regard, Eugene, how many federal credit unions had less than $1 million in total assets when we last changed the threshold, and how many have under $1 million in total assets today? Uh, when the current structure went into place in 2013, uh, there were 320 federal credit unions uh, that were below the $1 million threshold and thus were exempted. Uh, for 2020 uh, billing cycle, it was 180. So it had gone down from 320 to 180. And that's uh, my answer. Um, thank you so much uh, for that answer, Eugene. If we change the threshold to, say, $1.5 million, how many federal credit unions would qualify for the exemption? And what would the population be if we raised the exemption threshold to $5 million? Uh, sure, thank you. So the $1.5 million uh, that's uh, suggested in the notice uh, is reflective of the relative growth of the uh, assets of the industry. Um, so basically, what would if we, what, what's the million dollars kind of equal to today would be $1.5 million. Uh, and based on the current population of credit unions uh, and their reporting, uh, reported assets for the 2020 operating uh, fee billing cycle, uh, about 60 additional credit unions would be covered if we increased it to 1.5 million, um, and it would be about an additional 401 if the threshold was increased to $5 million. Thank you. So uh, the additional 60 at 1.5 million brings us up to 240 uh, uh, credit unions, and at a 5 million, you said it was an additional uh, 401, and uh, if I'm doing my math correctly, plus 180, that gets us to 581. Is that correct, Eugene? Yes, sir. And if we raised the operating fee exemption threshold to as high as $5 million, would there be a significant impact on those credit unions that do pay the operating fee, Eugene? Um, so if the threshold were raised to $5 million, um, mm -hmm. then I believe there would be about a shift of about $320,000 of operating fee revenue that we would not collect from those in that $1 million to $5 million cohort uh, that would then shift to the larger, relatively larger credit unions that would still be fee paying, um, which is a, a fairly small uh, percentage of the total operating fee, about maybe two-tenths of one percent? I appreciate that response, yeah, Eugene, and thank you for your analysis. I do have another question about the tiered structure of the operating fee. For quite some time, the regressive structure of the operating fee schedule has troubled me. Smaller credit unions end up paying more for oversight and regulation than larger credit unions um, and that they pay higher marginal rates for assets in the lower tiers, as you noted earlier today. Eugene, have you and your team conducted any analysis on whether the time spent by our examiners at credit unions with assets below $50 million has changed during the last decade? Uh, so we did get some information from the Office of Examination and Insurance, uh, which indicated that the Hours spent on, on those uh, that you're referencing below 50 million, uh, hours spent on those credit unions has been pretty stable over the past decade. It's, it's down slightly, just a couple of percentage points. Uh, somewhere between four and five percentage points, uh, Eugene? Yeah, depending on the, the particular year, but I think that's roughly the change uh, over the past decade. Uh, so, so the trend has been downward. 
Um, and have you uh, done any analysis um, for those credit unions, say, between $250 million in assets and $1 billion, as well as those between $1 billion in total assets and $10 billion? Uh, sure. Again, the, sort of the same look at the distribution of hours uh, by credit union asset size uh, indicates that the hours spent at those larger institutions has has steadily increased, um, and depending on the particular category, is is up roughly um, in the 30 percent, so a little over a third uh, during that uh, past decade. Uh, and, and that's for both buckets of credit unions. That's correct. Okay. As, as the amount of examination time has been increasing at larger credit unions compared to smaller credit unions in recent years, I believe it is appropriate for us to consider modifying the operating fee structure to establish a flat rate or even a progressive fee structure so that we do not penalize credit unions simply for being smaller. Small credit unions already have enough issues to deal with and keep their doors open. We therefore should find ways to give them a fair shake. As such, I especially look forward to receiving comments on this question. Additionally, I am very intrigued about whether we can offer some incentive to credit unions to complete the voluntary annual diversity self-assessment called for in the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. Diversity, equity, and inclusion are vitally important to the future of the credit union system, and they help to ensure the credit union system remains focused on fulfilling its mission of providing thrift to people of modest needs. I want to thank the NCUA staff for working to include language in this request for information that asks how we can incentivize not only federal credit unions to complete the voluntary diversity self-assessment, but also federally insured state chartered credit unions. I also appreciate board members McWater's modification to those suggestions he and his staff have improved the final product before us today. Finally, I concur with the assessment that our actions on the overhead transfer rate in recent years have made the calculation more equitable and transparent, as well as less complex than previous methodologies. Accordingly, while I do uh, not believe that we need to propose any changes to the methodology at this time, I think it is important to ask interested parties this question. In sum, I will, support for the, uh, I will support the issuance of this request for comment on the methodologies used for determining the overhead transfer rate and the operating fee schedule. I look forward to reviewing the comments we will receive. Thank you everyone for your, who has been involved in this rulemaking for putting this proposal together. Mr. Chairman, I have nothing more to add at this time. Thank you, Mr. Harper. I'd now like to recognize board member Mac Waters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When I joined the NCUA board about six years ago, I began a detailed study of the overhead transfer rate and found it entirely opaque and incomprehensible. In my view, it also yielded inconsistent and problematic results. We worked to completely revise the OTR methodology and finalize the restructured rules several years ago. The new OTR rule is far more intuitive, transparent, and inherently fair. That said, there is always room for improvement. I welcome and encourage members of the credit union community and others to submit comments on the OTR and the operating fee methodology for our analysis. I have no questions regarding the OTR submission for comment or the operating fee methodology proposal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am finished. Oh, thank you, Mr. McWaters. Is there a motion? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. I move that the board approve pub publication of the request for comment in the Federal Register for a 60-day comment period as attached to the board action memorandum. Is there a second to the motion? This is Board Member Harper. I second the motion. There is a sufficient second. All in favor say aye. All opposed say nay. All, opposed, all in aye. favor? Aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Well, the ayes have it. And let the record show the motion passed 3-0.
The fifth and final item on our agenda today is Board Briefing 2020 Mid-Session Budget. Staff presenting, Eugene Sheed, Chief Financial Officer. Okay, this time I will present uh, an overview of the NCOA's 2020 Mid-Session Budget. This is a status update to review the revised annual budgetary estimates as compared to the board approved 2020 budget. The revised annual projections take into account the ongoing situation uh, involving COVID-19 in NCOA's offsite and telework status, although that situation remains fluid. And I'll be uh, following along here on a slide presentation. So if we can move to slide number two. The overview. Um, for today's 2020 mid-session, I'll briefly describe the process we use in updating the annual budget forecast and cover the status of the operating budget, the capital budget, and the share insurance fund administrative budget, which are the three budgets that the NCUA board approves each year. I am not presenting any actions for the board's approval this morning. However, we continue assessing the budgetary impact of our current off site work situation, both where we are seeing savings and also anticipating some additional costs. Slide number three. The mid-session review process. In April, my office sent out guidance to all NCUA office directors and regional offices for their review, validation, and or re-estimate of their budget needs to address areas where updated information is available. This review applies to the three budgets approved by the board in 2020, the operating budget of $315.9 million and 1,185 staff positions, the capital acquisition budget of $25.1 million, and the share insurance fund administrative budget of $6.9 million and five staff positions. As footnoted on the bottom of this slide, in its action on the 2020 budget, the board also approved the use of balances remaining from the prior year's budget, 2019, and has also approved one new position in 2020. After the central office and regional office budget estimates are received, staff from my office review the recommended adjustments of budgetary needs and assess the reasonableness of the revised estimates. We assess the current staffing and payroll estimates, the anticipated filling of vacancies of staff positions, and compare this information to the board-approved pay and benefits budget. After review of recurring non-pay expenses, such as travel, supplies, training, and contract services, uh, that helps us assess the total budget trends. This is uh, where most of the input from each of the regional and central offices is most helpful to our analysis. Slide number four provides an overview of the status of the operating budget through May, as well as my projection for the end of the year. The mid-session estimate for the operating budget is that spending for 2020 will be approximately $7.2 million below the board-approved budget of $315.9 million. The primary reason for the lower spending projection is a significant reduction in travel-related expenses, which I will discuss in more detail on a following slide. The actual spending data on the slide, as I mentioned, is as of May, uh, consistent with when the office has provided their estimates to the CFO's office. Actual spending through June is now available uh, and was consistent with the preceding months. Slide number five, operating budget pay and benefits. The year-end estimate for employee pay and benefits is projected to be slightly higher, about 2%, than the amount estimated for the annual budget. In developing the 2020 budget, we tightened up our payroll estimates to better account for staff vacancies, meaning that we budgeted relatively less for payroll in 2020 than we would have otherwise using the same approach from the prior year. So far this year, overall staffing trends show a slight increase in the actual onboard staffing levels at NCUA as compared 
to the same period last year. This is important because pay and benefits expenses comprise over 73% of our annual operating budget. Projected benefits costs are tracking in line with estimates used in the development of the 2020 budget, which included a mandatory increase of 230 basis points uh, that the NCUA is required to pay to OPM for the employer share of employee retirement plan costs. My final note on this slide is that the mid-session compensation projection also factors in the disbursement of a portion of NCUA's accrued liability associated with employee leave in 2020, reducing the anticipated end-of-year balance. Slide number six. This slide looks at other non-payroll expenses. The non-payroll expenses share of the operating budget includes all other non-payroll related expenses, including contractual services, travel, administrative expenses, and rent communications and utilities. Overall, these non-personnel expenses are anticipated to be about 14% lower than budgeted. Due to the restrictions placed on employee travel because of COVID-19 precautions, which has led to off-site examinations, mandatory telework for office staff, and shifting training uh, to either be done online or delayed or canceled. Travel expenses are forecast to be about 48% lower than was budgeted for 2020. This is a conservative estimate, uh, and it assumes some level of, of examinations-related travel will resume as we progress through the remainder of the year. However, the timing of any resumption to on-site activity has not been made at this time. The other categories of non-personnel expenses are projected to be slightly higher than originally budgeted, also the result of COVID-19. The contractors who support NCUA continue to work on their tasks from an off-site posture. Modest increases are forecast for a variety of expenses which have increased due to COVID-19 and the shift to off-site work including licensing costs for various softwares and services that better enable remote employees to work and communicate, also remote communications and supply reimbursements due to off-site work, and increased cleaning supplies and facilities-related expenses. Slide number seven. Turning now to the capital budget, uh, the capital budget is showing no change in budgetary estimates uh, as compared to the board-approved 2020 budget of $25.1 million for capital projects. Project spending and project plans are generally consistent with the details and descriptions the NCUA published uh, as part of the 2020 budget. The funding provided by the NCUA board for capital projects generally remains available until these projects are completed which sometimes extend over multiple years. As part of our mid-session update, as we do every year, we will post on the website an update of the status of our capital projects. Slide number eight. The share insurance fund administrative budget. Projected obligations for the year against the 2020 board approved share insurance fund administrative budget of $6.4 million are estimated to be about $707,000 under budget for the end of the year. Again, the primary reason that uh, this is anticipated uh, to be below the board approved budget is due to reduced travel related expenses, which are the result of cancellation of on site training and shifting uh, to online training. Slide number nine Conclusions. Uh, slide number nine summarizes the budgetary forecast for 2020. Uh, again, at this time, no board action is sought with respect to the 2020 budget. As I discussed, we project a minor increase in total personnel compensation expenses as compared to the 2020 board approved budget, uh, which will uh, be more than offset by the uh, estimated underspending in the non-personnel categories. Projected travel expenses are forecasted to be almost 50% lower than the approved budget. This again assumes some, this financial estimate assumes some resumption of uh, on site work later this year, although that particular determination again has not been made at this time. 
We continue to refine our estimates for the other compensation-related categories in conjunction with anticipated resumption of on-site operations uh, and possible increases in certain costs uh, that could offset some of the projected travel savings. No changes are anticipated uh, for the capital budget for the remainder of the year, and the SIF administrative expenses are anticipated to be lower than budgeted due to lower travel-related spending. Slide number 10. So this slide provides additional information on resources on the NCOA budget uh, and contact information. Uh, we continue to work to improve our financial management transparency by building a comprehensive budget and financial document resource center on our website, uh, which you can see linked here. Uh, this website will be updated with mid-session materials that summarize uh, and include this presentation as well as the capital investment detail summaries that I mentioned. Uh, and finally, slide number 11 is my contact information. Uh, that concludes my presentation on the mid-session budget, and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Eugene, thank you for your presentation. I especially want to thank all of our NCRA staff who have all played a role in helping review our agency spending through the first half of the year, especially given the current circumstances as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, the board is considering reprogramming existing agency funds, essentially recalibrating the 2020 budget approved by the NCRA board. The budget we are discussing today was originally adopted in December of 2019 after publishing the draft in the Federal Register. The public budget briefing, where stakeholders were offered an opportunity to provide their views to the NCRA board and NCRA's request for any additional written comments. It is critical that the NCRA is a responsible steward of the funds we collect from credit unions and any other resources entrusted to us. We must at all times hold ourselves to the highest standard, and we will continue to be transparent regarding our budget. I'd also like to recognize that many of our stakeholders did in fact write letters uh, regarding our budget briefing today, and I'd like to mention that many of them referenced the importance of temporary regulatory relief measures and enhancements to the virtual examinations program that we have. I now want to ask a few questions. As we look at the mid-year budget, I want to especially highlight what is under consideration today that it includes the disbursement of pay to NCRA employees with accumulated leave. What would be the budget liability if we don't pay it this year, and would it be more harmful if vacation days were transferred over? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, so the value is of that the benefit in the leave is generally tied to the rates of pay at the time of distribution. Uh, so if the action were taken uh, next year that were similar uh, to distribute, uh, then the distri distribution would presumably be at, at a higher rate because uh, pay rates generally go up over time. And that's my answer to that question. And Eugene, could you talk a little bit about what the other financial regulators are doing regarding employee disbursement? I know from some of my meetings with some of the other FIREA heads, this issue has come up with some of the other agencies. Sure. Um, so uh, particularly uh, kind of speaking also historically, the other federal financial regulators uh, have made these sorts of disbursements in the past uh, as an effort to manage employee leave liability uh, and also importantly to ensure uh, that the appropriate working schedules and availability of staff uh, are needed to uh, perform critical functions. Thank you. Great, thank you. Based on your report, it sounds like our 2020 budget is in fairly good position and that we're even running a small surplus. What happens to the funds that NCUA does not spend at the end of the budget year? Um, so. There would be a variety of different possibilities, and, and I actually referenced one on one of the earlier slides where I noted that in addition to the board-approved budget uh, for the operating budget for 2020, uh, the board had also allocated some funds that had remained from 2019 uh, for a couple of items. Um, and so that's one possibility, um, and, and obviously one that uh, has precedent and was done uh, for this uh, to support uh, programs in this current year. 
Um, another possibility would just simply be to, uh, which the NCO has also done in the past, uh, would be to adjust the fee schedule. Um, so it could be reflective of lower fees. Again, the, as has been discussed this morning, the uh, operating budget is funded from both the OTR uh, and, and the operating fee, um, and so each of those could be credited back, essentially, um, the remainder of funds left at the end of the year. So those would be a couple of uh, options that NCUA has used in, in the past decade. Okay, that sounds great. And also, Eugene, you mentioned that some budget categories are lower than estimated due to the COVID-19, and of course, some higher. Can you elaborate a bit more on that? What's causing the savings and the added costs, and how they balance out on the whole? Um, so, the, on the non-personnel side, and well, actually, and even overall, the, um, the, the travel is a fairly significant uh, expense for NCOA um, after uh, paying compensation. And like I said, that's down 50%, um, and, and so that is a significant savings. There's a minor adjustment, and we see a minor shift because uh, staff, so instead of paying staff or reimbursing staff for their travel, uh, in many cases, we're now having to provide them with additional software, um, additional uh, communication support uh, from their remote duty stations or their homes. Um, and they're uh, eligible for reimbursement for some of those. So you see some minor upticks in some of like the administrative categories and, and rent categories just to pay for kind of some of those supplies and things that employees would otherwise just get from being in the office, um, but now uh, can't because of the offsite posture. Um, so we're seeing a really small increase in a few of those cash, cat, uh, cost categories, but overall the savings uh, from travel far outweighs that. Great. Well, thank you, Eugene. And I do just want to circle back briefly regarding the other financial regulators. As mentioned, it has come up in a number of our meetings where we've gotten together almost weekly since COVID-19. I do know that the OCC is looking at a similar posture where they're looking now at what would be uh, the fees and that they'd have to pay for uh, vacation. And I also understand the FDIC is as well. So I would just ask that as you have your meetings with your peers at the other agencies, it would be nice just to know um, what all of them are doing together. I think that many of them are beginning to now make public comments uh, to this effect. Of course, I'll keep you up to date, sir. Thank you. I have no further questions. I'd now like to recognize Board Member Harper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Eugene, for this mid-session briefing on the 2020 budget. I appreciate the OCFO team's diligence on these matters. In most years during the July meeting, the NCUA board would typically consider adjustments to the board approved budget to reflect changes in anticipated expenses and address new priorities. However, 2020 has proven to be anything but typical. In fact, I can't believe that any of us stayed up past midnight to welcome this new year in. The COVID-19 pandemic has quickly changed the NCUA's priorities and operations. It has also made it difficult for the NCUA board to consider and approve necessary budget changes at this time. Nevertheless, the NCUA team has responded superbly to this unprecedented situation. We have moved nearly all of our central and regional office operations to a virtual status with the vast majority of staff working from home. Except for instances of liquidation, conservatorships, and some fraud investigations, we are conducting our supervisory activities virtually, and staff are working very long hours to pivot our examination program, both to assess how the pandemic economic ramifications will affect individual credit union operations and to plan for mitigating the coming turmoil in the credit union system. I say coming turmoil because save for changes in member access to credit union branches and facilities, and the unfortunate decision of some credit unions to garnish government stimulus checks intended to pay for shelter, food, and medicine, the system seems to be performing well. As America's financial services first responders, credit unions are providing temporary financial support for out-of-work members who have lost their jobs. They are providing forbearances on mortgages, credit cards, and auto loans to households that no longer have a steady stream of income, 
and they are providing much-needed financial advice to families living in fear of what lies ahead. To date, we have not encountered reports of major operational or liquidity issues within the credit union system. And thanks to a sizable fiscal stimulus approved by Congress, most federally insured credit unions are currently flush with the cash provided by the economic impact payments and supplemental unemployment insurance benefits, as well as the deposits made as consumers move their money out of the capital markets and into the safety of federally insured credit unions. Those governmental payments to consumers and support for small businesses provided by the Paycheck Protection Program, as well as other programs established by the Federal Reserve, have prevented our economy from experiencing a freefall. This federal financial life support, however, will eventually wane and end. At that time, without the wide distribution of an effective vaccine or a cure for the disease, we should expect economic turmoil to increase. We can also expect credit unions to experience a drawdown on their deposits as and increases in loan losses, potentially leading to severe liquidity concerns. That is why the NCUA must continue to ask Congress to extend the temporary enhancements to the central liquidity facility. I sincerely appreciate the work of the Office of External Affairs and Communications on this urgent matter. It is also why more credit unions, both federally insured and privately insured, need to join the CLF. By joining the central liquidity facility, credit unions will be demonstrating the best of the cooperative nature of the credit union movement. Every member who joins the CLF will be exponentially increasing the capacity of the central liquidity facility to provide liquidity to others within the system. And even if a credit union ultimately does not use the CLF in the coming months, its support for the CLF may help another credit union with significant liquidity needs to survive a crisis not of its own making. With that said, Eugene, I do have some questions and a comment about your presentation today. Uh, and I do have um, some of my questions are similar to those asked by the chairman. If you could pull up slide five, in the last bullet, you note that forecasts, quote, reflect the liquidation of a portion of the NCUA's accrued liabilities associated with employee leave in 2020, reducing the anticipated end of year balance. Eugene, aren't we really talking about a leave payout program to compensate our hardworking workforce who are foregoing vacations and time off during this crisis for the annual leave that they have earned but will not use in 2020? Uh, so this will compensate employees for those hours earned, uh, unused leave balances uh, to which they are entitled, and also help uh, NCUA uh, manage the uh, availability uh, of critical staff. As, again, you were alluding to in your comments, uh, the, the effects of the fiscal crisis uh, perhaps become more acutely felt. Sure. So this program really is, in a way, fairly compensating our employees who are clocking in long hours at home, week after week, month after month, for their hard work in protecting the credit union system. That is the right thing to do. Nevertheless, critics may claim otherwise. Consequently, Eugene, I would like to know what fiscal guardrails we will put in place to manage this program and serve as an effective steward of the funds we manage on behalf of the members of credit unions. Okay, sure. Um, so the program, uh, this only applies to employees who are in a position where they may have to forfeit uh, something that they've otherwise earned. Uh, so it does not apply to everybody. Um, and it also uh, only partially covers uh, those hours that employees might potentially lose. So uh, there are some, some pretty tight uh, uh, controls on this. And aren't we also thinking about limiting the total hours? So it, it, it should be 80 hours at the maximum that we'll, we will be compensating for? Um, so that would be the, the max. Uh, many employees would not be eligible even, even for that, but that would be the maximum for someone who is in a position of forfeiting potentially even more than that. Thank you. I, I really appreciate those observations. I have another question for you, Eugene, on a different matter. On slide four, in the travel budget line, we are currently anticipating a $13 million decrease in spending. That estimate seems fairly conservative to me. 
In fact, given the current levels of COVID-19 cases and anticipated increases this fall, I predict that we might end up spending considerably less on planes, trains, automobiles, and hotel rooms in the months ahead. In the event that we have a sizable budget surplus at the end of the year and we have not allocated that funding towards other priorities, what will happen? Uh, sure. So, um, yeah, again, the, my assumption on the, the travel assumed there would be some, some resumption of activity, which you know, is completely undetermined at this point. Um, and as you can see from the presentation, I think the slide that's uh, currently up, slide four, um, you know, there's about $20 million, if you factor in June, uh, that has not been spent in travel. Um, so uh, there will be some, uh, all other things being equal and, and no other sort of uh, uh, crises arise, uh, just from the travel line, we'll, we'll have some, certainly some surplus. Uh, and as I was mentioning it in response to the chairman's question, I mean, the two most obvious scenarios about what, what happens to those funds uh, just based on NCOA's recent history would be they could either be used to reduce the size of the budget next year, which ultimately means that there's less new fees collected um, and less new uh, transfer from the SIF, um, or they could just be more directly credited back to those two. Um, either way, the, the effect winds up being the same, that depending on how the overall budget process plays out, um, whatever funds remain from 2020 will uh, is effectively be a part of the conversation for 21 uh, when we talk about the budget and the operating fee schedule. Thank you for that useful explanation. Finally, although it is not outlined in your public presentation, one of the larger increases in light items currently under consideration for the mid-session budget is providing an additional $80,000 to $100,000 to the Office of External Affairs and Communications for contracts related to Section 508 compliance. The Rehabilitation Act requires federal agencies like the NCUA to make their electronic and information technology accessible to people with disabilities. Spending by the agency on Section 508 compliance is long overdue, and it is wholly appropriate as we recognize this month the 30th anniversary of the enactment of the Americans with Disability Act. By increasing access to information on our website, we will be serving the American public and the credit union system well. Before I close, I do have several comments about the 2021 budget. Ultimately, a budget is about setting priorities. And as we look to the year ahead, I see several concerns that we must address. First, given the likely problems with loan losses, a struggling economy, and compressed earning margins that many federally insured credit unions will experience, we need to focus on safety and soundness by ensuring that we have sufficient examination staff with the necessary skills to supervise the system and protect the share insurance fund and taxpayers from losses. Therefore, we cannot further cut field staff and we should consider whether to return to an annual exam posture for all credit unions, as we did during the last financial crisis. And the economic fallout of the pandemic will continue to affect consumers severely. As such, we can anticipate an increased number of consumer complaints that we must consider and resolve. We will also need to ensure that credit unions follow consumer financial protection laws and comply with the responsibilities towards members. As I noted at the board table last year, robust consumer financial protection supervision of credit unions is vitally important, both for individual borrowers and for the health of the whole economy. Accordingly, we cannot yet again shortchange staffing in the Office of Consumer Financial Protection. Finally, in response to the Black Lives Matter and social justice protests that our nation continues to experience in the last two months since George Floyd's killing and the need for the NCUA to implement a concrete action plan to advance economic inequality and justice within the credit union system, I will be working to ensure that our 2021 budget continues efforts to build a diverse and inclusive workforce and supplier chain, enhances support for minority depository institutions, enforces fair lending laws, and advances initiatives aimed at closing the wealth gap. In closing, Mr. Chairman, I recognize that my comments on this matter has run long today, and I thank you for your indulgence. 
I also know that we share a commitment to advancing economic equality and justice. So I am optimistic that we will find common ground on these matters during the deliberations over the 2021 budget. Finally, thank you again, Eugene, for the effort that you and your team put into the mid-session budget review. Please let your team know that I am grateful for their diligence and professionalism during these very unusual times. Mr. Chairman, I have no further questions and comments at this time. Thank you, Board Member Harper, and I do think that we can find common ground around issues that I care about as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion. For me, those have been areas that I have focused most of my professional career in addressing the inequities that exist in our communities and do look forward to working with you in partnership to address them, and especially as it uh, relates to helping our MDIs continue to serve communities of color where access to capital is needed now more than ever. With that being said, I'd now like to recognize Board Member McWaters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me second your comments towards Board Member Harper. I uh, couldn't agree with you more. Um, although we're not voting today on the mid-year NCUA budget, I wish to comment on the allocation of additional resources to the agency's consumer protection mission. Consumer protection is endemic to the NCUA and the credit union community as the typical credit union's business model focuses almost entirely on extending credit and other financial services to its member consumers. Treating consumers inappropriately is not only wrong and in violation of the law, it's bad for credit union business and undermines the agency's safety and soundness mandate. As such, it's imperative that we provide the agency's consumer protection staff with the resources necessary to continue to proactively safeguard credit union consumers. The 120 or so million Americans rely on credit unions and our staff who carry the burden of protecting those consumers deserve that commitment. I encourage my colleagues to allocate additional resources to our consumer protection mission when they vote to consider the mid-year NCUA budget and the 2021 NCUA budget. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I have no questions. Thank you, Mr. McWaters. As we conclude our agenda, I do want to note that Mr. McWaters contacted my office on yesterday wanting an opportunity to address uh, the NCUA board uh, at today's meeting. So for that reason, Board Member McWater, sir, you are recognized for a point of personal privilege. The floor is yours, Mr. McWaters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As the President's nominee approaches confirmation to the NCUA board, I will soon wrap up six years as a board member. I congratulate Kyle Hoppen on his nomination and wish him the very best during his term. So as to negate any ambiguity, I will not leave the board until Mr. Hoffman takes the oath of office. It has been my distinct honor and privilege to serve as a chair and as a board member of the NCUA. I wish to thank each of you who have assisted me in a vast array of issues over my tenure. The list is very long and grows longer each day. To the extent I have succeeded, it's because of you. Otherwise, it's on me. I wish to express special thanks and appreciation to my Chief of Staff, Sarah Vega, and my Executive Administrative Assistant, Katie Supples. Their judgment, guidance, and counsel were invaluable and without parallel. Sarah joined the NCUA in 2008 and worked with Chair Frizzell during one of the darkest periods for the credit union community. Her experience as a state regulator and attorney enabled her to assist him and the entire NCUA staff in creating a program that saved thousands of credit unions and laid the foundation for the recovery of billions of dollars for the Share Insurance Fund. She worked with me when I served as chair and as a board member with three other chairs and their chiefs of staff. Her service at the NCUA in the position she has held is without rival in the agency's history. 
Katie also joined the industry board in 2008 and served with Chair Frizzell and me for six years each. Katie kept the trains and me organized and running on time, always in a professional yet entirely pleasant manner. Like Sarah, she was absolutely invaluable. I wish both Sarah and Katie all the best in their next endeavors. I offer my thanks and appreciation to Chair Rick Metzger and his Chief of Staff Mike Radway, who proved, along with members of my office and the NCUA staff, that it is indeed possible to manage a federal agency for over three years in a collegial, collaborative, and bipartisan manner. I also wish to offer my sincere thanks to former NCUA Chair Mike Frizzell and to countless members of the credit union community for their insight and judgment over the years. In closing, I wish my colleagues, Chair Rodney Hood and Board Member Todd Harper and the NCUA staff the very best. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am done. Thank you, Mr. McWaters, for your leadership. In addition to Mr. McWaters, Board Member Harper would also like to have an opportunity to address the board. Board Member Harper, you too have a right of personal privilege to address the board. The floor is yours. Thank, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for letting me recognize my friend and colleague, J. Mark McWaters. While we cannot state with any certainty that this meeting will be his last as an NCUA member, it might well be. In meeting Mark for the first time during his confirmation process more than six years ago, he immediately impressed me with his capacity to learn about and understand the nuances of the credit union system, such as why we wouldn't refer to a credit union's earnings as a return on investment. Moreover, during his time at the NCUA, Mark has approached his job with diligence and an attention to detail that you would expect of an accomplished uh, academic, a certified accountant, and a transaction lawyer. What is more, Mark has achieved an accomplished record as an NCUA board member and chairman. Notably, he oversaw the early closure of the temporary corporate credit union stabilization fund and the distribution of nearly $1 billion in assets to federally insured credit unions. He also made the voluntary merger process more transparent and accountable, and he made lasting reforms to how the agency conducts its work. In thanking Mark today, I also must recognize the work of his great team. Sarah Vega has served as a senior policy advisor longer than anyone in the agency's history. Much of Mark's success, as he noted, at the NCUA is attributable to her thoughtful guidance and exceptional knowledge of credit unions and the system's regulations. In Katie Supples, Mark's executive assistant, has spent more than 12 years at the NCUA in the old Office of Public and Congressional Affairs and with board members Frizel and McWaters. She is the conductor who always remains calm and delightful while keeping the trains moving on time. I look forward to a time when we can get together in person and celebrate their accomplishments. Until then, I wish Mark, Sarah, and Katie a bon voyage for whenever their journeys with the NCUA end and their next professional adventures begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. If, Harper. If, if, if I may say oh. so, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank um, Board Member Harper for his kind words. You know, Todd, you were the first person I met at the NCUA when you thoughtfully shepherded me through my confirmation process in your role as the agency's PACA director. You know, although we've occasionally differed on policy issues over the years, it has never been personal, as we have treated each other in an entirely transparent, forthright, and professional manner. I thank you for that and wish you and Catherine the very best. You are a valued addition to the NCUA board, and I have welcomed and enjoyed your intellect, policy perspectives, and sense of humor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, thank you, Mr. McWaters, and I, too, want to thank you and Sarah and Katie for your contributions left at the agency. But however, as chair, I want to wait for the appropriate time when we do have our nominee officially confirmed so that I can appropriately thank you and recognize you uh, for the great work and legacy that you're leaving. 
I also want you to know that we will be hosting a farewell at the appropriate time where we, again, will honor you and, again, uh, give you all the all the praise that you need in terms for you to know that the credit union industry uh, has gleaned a lot of insight from your erudition. They have certainly learned a lot from your role uh, that you played in advancing capital standards, and you were so great and kind and gracious in swearing me in when I uh, came to the agency last year. Also, would just like to note that as we prepare to host an appropriate farewell for you, I will be reaching out to all the other folks who worked with you, and that would be Rick Metzger and Debbie Metz, to ask that they join me in a bipartisan celebration of your legacy to the NCUA and to the credit union industry. So thank you, and more to come at the appropriate time. With that being said, everyone, this does bring our agenda today to an end, but I want to continue to take our, thank our staff for the great work they're doing to keep the agency functioning properly and efficiently and getting all of our mission critical work done as we work in a remote posture. It's my fervent prayer that they all and their families remain healthy and safe. As we as a board will not be meeting in the month of August, I don't want anyone uh, joining us to think that that means that the agency is on vacation. We will still continue looking after the needs of those 121 million credit union member owners who want their credit unions to be there for them now more than ever. So with that being said, thank you. This meeting is adjourned.